Hi, this is Dr. Victoria Nalole, a research fellow at the Extractive Hub, based at the Centre for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral and Policy at the University of Dundee in the UK. Here with me is my good friend from Kenya, Ms. Nduta Njenga, and she will be taking us through social license to operate in Kenya, but she will mostly focus on specific projects. She will be giving us examples from a few projects in Kenya. Uh, but before we start on that discussion, I'd like Ms. Nduta to briefly introduce herself and thereafter she will take us through the aspect of social license to operate. Thank you, Victoria, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. My name is uh, Nduta Njenga and I am currently engaged as the Energy Policy Advisor um, at the Ministry of Water, Irrigation and Energy at the State Department of Energy here in Addis Ababa um, as an Oxford Policy Fellow. Um, I am a lawyer by profession. So I am originally from uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, with the bulk of my experience being gained uh, from uh, public sector and governance uh, issues within the extractive sector. The extractive sector in this case being oil, gas, and um, mineral resources. And um, today I'm here to talk a little bit about a social license to operate in the extractive sector. Um, and I will give one example of an instance in which I have seen the proper management of these SLO issues lead to a productive, um, a mutually productive, conclusive a mutually productive conclusion for a country and its investors. Um, it is trite knowledge that the extractive sector in any country, uh, its development and management has the potential to be a game changer for a country. Um, it is common knowledge that the extractive sector can propel a country from point A to point B. And I think it is a dream of every country to capitalize on its extractive sector whilst these resources are still in play. As you know, they are finite resources, therefore they will end one day. Usually the operation of the extractive sector happens within a particular legal and regulatory framework. Uh, this means that an investor has to meet certain um, minimum requirements, usually around its uh, financial and technical capability. Once they get those formal approvals, they have to work within the provisions of the law, um, taxation requirements, reporting requirements, so on and so forth. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the consents that must be acquired, um, but that of an informal nature. So I suppose I would define social, the social license to operate, or my understanding of the social license to operate, are the informal consents that an investor needs to acquire to enable them to successfully um, execute a project within the extractive sector. Um, in my country of origin, Kenya, there was a project known as it's, it's still ongoing, the early oil pilot scheme, EOPS. Uh, this inf information is available in the public domain. And the project is basically a pre-FDP um, attempt to transport uh, modest quantities of crude uh, from the development fields via the road network uh, to the storage facility and then uh, outward for export. Uh, this project, um, the ethos behind the project is to stress test the system and to enable um, any potential issues to be addressed so that by the time FID is declared or FID is announced, then there will be maximum capitalization of the project for the benefit of you know, all parties concerned. Um, so for a long time, uh, what, what has been happening is that while the crude has been brought out of the ground, it has been stored and then 
a few months ago in June of uh, 2018, uh, His Excellency the President flagged it off for its initial maiden uh, transport um, towards the storage facility. But there was a huge um, impasse between the community and the investor. And this had a significant impact resulting in um, an actual stopping of the activities for some time, for a few weeks, which resulted in um, significant cost and time overruns. This is obviously not a positive situation for all parties concerned. On one hand, the government loses time and money, the investor loses a lot of time and a, a, a lot of money, and the community loses out on the immediate benefits of having the presence of the investor. Thankfully, the situation was resolved when um, representatives from the government, re representatives from, from the investor and the communities had a roundtable discussion and came up with a committee that was able to talk openly, iron out the issues, and eventually the project um, was able to progress. To me, this is an example of what can happen when the social legitimacy is mismanaged. And at the same time, it's, it's an example of what can happen when it's managed properly. Um, my understanding of the acquisition of social legitimacy is it can only happen in an environment where there is honesty, where there is openness, where there is willingness to put all the issues on the table and to discuss. Um, to the extent that a community or to the extent that any stakeholders, stakeholders here being anyone who is either directly or indirectly impacted by a project, um, so to the extent that stakeholders perceive your project or perceive a project as positive, perceive a project as considerate of a people's culture, people's traditions, um, to the extent that a project is well received is the extent to which the project is able to be sustainable. And I think this is the ultimate desire of any investor. Once you get the buy-in of the community, they will support the project. Um, and when you have support, you can achieve much more than what is um, possible, not just within the law, but in that once a positive relationship is created. So my understanding is that any investor ultimately wants a buy-in of the community. But this is only possible where people are able to sit down and have open, honest discussions free of antagonism, free of perceptions of dishonesty, free of perceptions of uh, vested interest. And ultimately, it is better for a project not just to acquire the formal approvals, but to acquire the informal approvals as well. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Nduta. I really like the discussion on social license to operate, and I'm sure this is my first interview on this aspect, and I've liked the examples you've given from Kenya, and I'm sure our viewers will have more questions about this. I'll not ask follow-up questions right now, because I'll leave it to the viewers to ask whatever questions they have. You can direct the questions to Ms. Nduta. I'll be displaying her contact details or you can address the questions through the Extractive Hub and be well assured that we shall respond to the questions. And definitely we shall have Ms. Nduta on board again. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, our podcast, and also visit the Extractive Hub website for more videos from, on energy and mining from different experts. Uh, again, Ms. Nduta, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And for those who want to contact her with respect to issues regarding the extractive sector in Kenya, please do not hesitate to contact her. And she's currently based in Ethiopia, so definitely you have the expert who will be addressing you on these issues. Thank you.